What is today? Tabernacle. What is it? Tabernacle. Okay, Tabernacle started Friday night. When does it end? Sunday. This Friday. <laughs> this coming Friday. But what is today, as far as the church is concerned, the, the ecclesiastical calendar? Yes, thank you. It's Communion Sunday. This is the day that the church is set apart for us to celebrate communion worldwide as the body of Christ. And what does communion mean to you? It's a symbol, this communion that we celebrate, this, the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. We don't call it the... No, we don't call it the Mass. That has a very different meaning to it. But we call it the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. And the communion represents the communion that we're to have with the Lord. To be sincere, to be open, to be transparent, to be honest with him about all that we are and all that we are not. And that all that he is. And asking him to continue that work he began in us for his glory. Amen? Amen. Yeah. May the God of glory work within us through the living word to bring glory to God. Amen? And so when do we celebrate communion, beloved? This Wednesday night, the first Wednesday of every month, that's when we celebrate communion. Because we don't have a closed communion. It's open to anyone and everyone who professes faith in Christ and acknowledges him as their Lord and Savior, right? and the forgiveness of their sins. And so that communion is open to everyone. But we don't do it on Sunday morning only because, you know, <clears throat> we're warned not to take of the table of the Lord in an unworthy manner. And how would we do that in an unworthy manner? I'm sorry? Fitting it into the schedule? <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that, but okay. Right, but how would you take it in an unworthy manner? As Paul warns, Paul warns us in Corinthians not to partake of the table of the Lord in an unworthy manner, for then you would eat and drink judgment unto yourself without examining yourself and doing it in a hypocritical manner. Where are we in Acts this morning? Chapter 7, that's right. And what's taking place in chapter 7? We have the religious leadership, once again, of Israel rejecting God's man, rejecting God's way, absolutely rejecting God himself. Yet they're in such hypocrisy, believing that they're in a relationship with the Lord that doesn't exist. Is my microphone on? Yeah, okay. Uh, and so that would be partaking in an unworthy manner, presenting yourself as something that you know you are not before the Lord. Because the Lord knows, doesn't he? Yeah. We're all flawed individuals, aren't we? For all have, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. And, and so we, we need to be recognizing that and we come to God in that communion. So Wednesday night is your opportunity for us to come together. Now, we do it very differently if you're not here, uh, used to uh, our communion here at the chapel. We don't pass the elements out for fear that someone would take it in an unworthy manner, feel a compulsion, or feel pressured to take it. We don't want you to feel that way. No, no, no. We want you to think through this and know that we're recognizing our shortcomings, we're confessing our sins, you know. And that, that's why we need his mercy every day, right? His mercies are new every morning. Why? Because we're, we're all sinners. We all fall short. And so if we'll be honest and confess our sins, humble ourselves before the Lord, submit to the Lord, then he'll forgive us of our sins. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we'll walk out of here clean and new again. And that's what our communion means. So we don't pass out the elements for fear that someone would take it in an unworthy manner. But what we do on Wednesday nights, and then we devote the entire service just to communion. Why? It's the most worshipful thing we ever do. Why? Because we're, listen, right now we're going to do a Bible study, and I pray that the Holy Spirit speaks through me. I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. I pray that in spite of what I don't say in the text, that he'll begin to work in your heart through the living word, right? To glorify the God of the word. Hmm? But when we commune on Wednesday night, it doesn't involve anybody but you and 
the Lord. And that's a very holy thing. Moses, take off thy sandals. Moses, you're on holy ground. Why was it holy? Not because the ground was holy, because of his presence. And so that's what we need to discern in the communion table. Not in a lot that the elements are his body and his blood. No, 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 no. We don't believe that. There are groups that believe that erroneously. That's a bad doctrine. But we believe that the elements are symbolic of his broken body, his shed blood, right? And then he would be present in our desire to grow in our oneness with him, in that intimacy, in that closeness with him. I, I don't know about you, but I, I want to draw closer to him than I've ever been before in my life. When, when did you stop seeking the Lord? Never. That's the correct answer. I've been seeking the Lord for 43 years. And there are so many blessings associated that the, the word of God gives us relative to those who would seek the Lord. But the Lord first begins to work in our life, to open up our mind, our hearts, our eyes to the truth of who he is, and then we begin to pursue him. We begin to seek him. Hmm? Yeah, seek the Lord while he may be found. So this Wednesday night, you can take the time now, between now and Wednesday evening, to prepare your hearts and your lives for communion. So you don't take it in a casual or flippant manner, but you take it with reverence and seriousness, with sincerity and honesty, as we should. Amen? Amen. Well... We are continuing our study in Acts. If you're new to the chapel here, I'm a Bible expositor, and all that simply means is we go through the scriptures in an expositional fashion. I start with a book of the Bible. We're in the book of Acts. I start with the first word, first verse, first chapter, and we go through the entire text, trying to bring out all of the understanding of the text, because for every single biblical text, there's how many technical interpretations? You sure? Yeah, that's the truth. For every single biblical text, when you're using grammatical hermeneutical principles, uh, you're, you're, you're going to discover that there's only one technical interpretation of every single biblical text. Now, you can apply it in many different ways, metaphorically, allegorically, to your life, but you first have to seek to find out the technical interpretation. So we've been going through the book of Acts, and it's really the history of the early church. Luke is recording this for us. He records for us that the promise of the Father has come upon those early disciples, and those early disciples were primarily who? They were Jews. There were no Gentiles at this time yet, were there? No, they were Jews. And so what was birthed on Pentecost? Messianic Judaism. Now, I know, I know that everybody understands the church was birthed on Pentecost, but that's not technically true. Technically, it was Messianic Judaism. Now, we'll find out as we move further into chapter 8, chapter 9, that, that the Gentiles are grafted in. If you're going to divide the book of, of uh, Acts up, it's divided up in the way in which God commanded his disciples to go ye therefore and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in to the ends of the earth. And that's precisely how it's divided up. Now we're going to see at the end of chapter 7 that the witness by the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem will be over. Why? Because they rejected him. And we'll see that in a moment. How Israel's history has been a rejection of God's man, of God's will, of God's way, of God himself. Hmm, we don't ever want to be caught accused of that or found guilty of rejecting God, God's will, God's man, God's purpose is God's way, right? Yeah. Now, after chapter 2, we saw that there was an empowering of the church by the Holy Spirit. And we need the Holy Spirit's power to be the witnesses he's called us to be. Amen? Yeah. Now, there was a beginning persecution that took place as Peter and John healed the man, the lame man, before the gate called Beautiful, the Corinthian Gate. Uh, there was a great uproar, and so they were arrested by the Sanhedrin, and they warned him never to speak in this man's name. Silence! Right? But they went out, and they went right back to where they were apprehended at first, and they began to share Jesus all over again. And then we saw that in uh, chapter 6, they got rearranged. All 12 of the apostles got arrested. You remember? I think it was in chapter 5. So look with me at chapter 5 for a moment, and look at the response from the Sanhedrin. Now, who was the high priest at this time? 
Caiaphas. And who was the high priest when Jesus was crucified? Caiaphas, the same man who crucified Jesus. Now they're standing before, and he has the power of life and death over them, but they could care less. Why? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? Yeah. But here, listen, here's what I want you to pay attention to this morning. is just what they said after they released these men, because remember they had Gamaliel who gave his advice that they should let them go, otherwise they may be found contending with the Lord. But in chapter 5, in verse 26, the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them and set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Wow. So they all went back to Galilee, got in their boats, and went fishing because they were so afraid of these threats. Is that true? Is that what happened? No, 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 no. But as we move further on into the text, we, we saw that there were seven men chosen to settle a dispute that arose in the church. Can you imagine disputes in the church? You can't even imagine such a thing, can you? That there'd be disputes in the church? I, I wish I could not imagine such a thing, but it does happen. But, but the wisdom that was given to these early leaders within the church, the elders, they appointed seven men full of the Holy Spirit, of good reputation, to settle this dispute between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. What was the difference between a Hellenist and a Hebrew? Yeah, the Hebrew was a native-born, full Jew, Hellenists were those who embraced Greek culture or may have been a uh, part Jew, part Greek. And so there was a prejudice, a discrimination against them. They were seen as inferior. And so there was something that was taking place among the distribution of those things that they needed where the Hellenist widows were being treated unfairly. And so the wisdom that prevailed was they established a group of men who would be responsible for the physical well-being of the body there, the body of Christ, and they were all Hellenists. And the first two that are mentioned, we're going to say, Luke develops their, uh, an understanding of their character more for us as we go into the text. But who were the first two? Stephen, Stephen and, and Philip. So we've been looking at the life of Stephen. Stephen is a man who is full of the Holy Spirit and, and of good reputation. And he has such a powerful grasp upon the Old Testament and how it all pointed to Jesus, Yahshua. All of it fulfilled in Christ. That with the illumination of the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit gives revelation. The Holy Spirit gives illumination. You know, you, you can have all kinds of degrees and all kinds of education and all kinds of certificates. It means nothing if you haven't been born again. Because you're still a natural man. And Paul would tell the Corinthians, the natural man cannot discern the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. And so if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, if you're not born again, born of the Spirit of God, there's every reason that you cannot understand the Word of God and you can't interpret it correctly, no matter your education. But here, listen, here's this man they appointed to be a deacon, a table waiter. That's what he's been assigned to. Waiting on tables, taking care of the distribution of the food. And, you know, a deacon's responsibility, we have deacons and we have elders here at the chapel. That's our polity, our church government. And the deacons are responsible for the physical well-being of the church, where the elders are responsible for the spiritual house, the spiritual church. And, and so those two responsibilities are given, not one greater than the other, depending upon the giftedness that God gives us an individual or a man. And it appears Stephen was gifted in that area to be able to be gracious and compassionate and giving. And so he was exercising his gift there. But what amazes me is the depth of understanding that this young man had at such a young age and so early in the life of the church. There, there's no excuse for us, any of us, not to be deep in our understanding of the word of God, God's ways, God's purposes, God's word. The only reason why we would not, we're lazy. We don't dig into the text for ourselves. Never before in the history of the church have we had the capacity, the ability to interpret the scriptures so, the, the depth and the, and the quantity of scriptures so accurately. 99% of the scriptures can be interpreted very, very accurately. 
today. We're so blessed. Most of the resources that are available to us to study the scriptures are in one particular language. What's that? English. English. Do you know that? The majority of the world's reference materials, resources for studying the word of God is primarily in the English language. Yet never before has the church, the professing church, Christian dumb, been so dumb when it comes to the word of God, with regard to the word of God. So how do you understand that? Never before have we had the ability to interpret the scriptures so clearly, but never before has the church in total been so ignorant of the word of God they say they believe. It's amazing, isn't it? But this man, Stephen, wow, I, I so admire this young man. But it tells us that Stephen was a man full of the Holy Spirit and of good reputation. That's why he was chosen. And it says, uh, verse 6, uh, let's go to uh, in verse one of chapter six, in those days, a number of disciples were multiplying and there became a complaint by the Hebrews among the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution and the 12 summoned a multitude of disciples and said, it's not good, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, that we may give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that's where Stephen comes into play. That's where this, this office of the deaconos or deacons comes about in the early church. They weren't called that at this time, but that's what they became. Stephen and Philip and five others. And it tells us in verse 8 that Stephen was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. Wow. And then there arose some from the, what is called the synagogue of the freemen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Who were they? Synagogue of the freemen. Come on, we talked about this, right? Did we not talk about Who were they? Jews who were Roman, Jews who were Roman citizens. In what way? They purchased their citizenship? Freeborn, freeborn. Who might one of them be? Paul, Saul of Tarsus. He was a freeborn Roman citizen. He was one of these free men who was disputing with Stephen. Just want to bring that point up because we're going to see Saul again in a minute here. But we know that what had happened was because of envy, because of jealousy. And who was envious? Who was jealous? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jews, the religious leadership. Hey, how many churches are there? How many denominations are there? There are many denominations, right? And it's amazing the things we argue over, isn't it? You know, we've got an enemy. It's just not one another, okay? Isn't that true? Our enemy is not one another. We've got an enemy out there. But why do we waste so much time, so much energy arguing with one another? Yeah, we have many denominations, and most of these denominations have split over non-essential issues. We should never split over none of sin. Do we, do we all agree on everything? No, no. Just get married. You'll find out. <laughs> because your perspectives are so different, right? We don't always agree, but we always agree to, uh, we always agree to disagree agreeably, agreeably, right? Yeah, but how many churches are there? One. One church. I had, to, I had to have that procedure earlier in the week, and the, and the girl said to me, what race are you? Human. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, what race are you? I said, I'm being serious. I'm of the human race. There's only one race. Many tribes. I'm from the Italian tribe. <laughs> but one race, one race of people, right? How many churches are there? One. Don't lose sight of that. There's only one church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. Amen? Yeah. And so Stephen was full of faith and power and the Holy Spirit. He did many signs and wonders among the people. Wow, and this deacon, table waiter, given such power by the Holy Spirit. But then these false witnesses arose against him. Verse 13, they also said a fault was this who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face shining like an angel. Well, now we've been through all of this in the text before, haven't we? Yeah. 
I'm just bringing this to remembrance because last week Dr. Chafee was here, and so I thought we'd just catch up to where we were. Now Stephen is standing before the same council, the same group of people, the same power, right? And we're supposed to speak truth to power? Oh boy, does he speak truth to power. The same group that, that sentenced Jesus to death. But there's no fear in Stephen. No, the righteous will be as bold as lions in the day of adversity. Jesus told his disciples previously, they will take you and bring you before councils. And you're not to worry about what you're to say. For in that hour, at that time, the Holy Spirit will tell you exactly what to speak. I don't think Stephen had any notes, do you? No. Longest sermon in the book of Acts, longest chapter, chapter 7 in the book of Acts. And yet this young man, he could connect all the dots. Such an understanding of the Old Testament and the promises that were made regarding the Messiah, right? The book, the blood, and the blessed hope, right? <laughs> so the high priest Caiaphas said, are these things so? What they're accusing him of, of blasphemy, blaspheming the word of God, blaspheming God, blaspheming Moses, blaspheming the commandments of Moses? No, 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 none of these things are so. Now, he's going to go on, and he's going to give a, a defense of himself, and he's going to answer these charges, and he's going to answer them based upon their own scriptures, their own history. It's so important that you have a correct Israelology. The one missing aspect of most systematic theology is how many of you have a systematic theology at home? Right? And, and I'll bet your systematic theology does not have an Israelology in it. Because none of them do. Wait a minute. What's the problem with that? What's the number one main subject of the scriptures? All 66 books. Jesus. No, oh, see, I baited you. <laughs> you said Israel. No, the number one topic of the scriptures, all 66 books, is Jesus, right? The centrality of Jesus. But what's the second most dominant subject of the scriptures? Israel, Israel. Yet so many have no understanding of the Israelology of the Bible. It's amazing, isn't it? But that's precisely what Stephen is going to use to explain and give his defense to the Sanhedrin. Listen to this. And he said, brethren, fathers, listen to me, the God of glory. That's a good place to start, isn't it? The glory of God, not the glory of man. The glory of God. The God of glory appeared to our fathers Abraham, and he went and, and was in Macedon, uh, uh, Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. So he told Abraham to get a what? Ur Hall. He had to go to get an Ur Hall, get out of Ur of the Chaldees, right? And he went to Haran. But when his father-in-law died, and then he went to Canaan. That's what he's rehearsing for them, the history of when it all began for the Jews, for the Hebrews, the Himrabi. He moved him to this land in which we now dwell. Verse 5, and God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on it, but even when Abraham had no children, he promised to give it to him as for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. Wow. Just as it happened, you know. Now, Abraham never had any property at all that he owned himself, except what? Burial. burial plot. That's it. He had a burial ground, the cave of Machpelah, is what he purchased to bury his dead. But God said, who's going to be his inheritance? Who will be his reward? God would. Is God your reward? Is Jesus not enough? Come on, we talked about this before. Is, is Jesus your exceedingly great reward? I mean, what, do we, what more do we need? If we have Jesus, we have everything. And besides that, everything else that you have in this life, you're leaving it or it's leaving you, right? Is that not true? But our relationship with Jesus, it's forever, forever, right? And no inheritance except that cave of Machpelah. But he said that, that God himself would be Abraham's great reward. And so Ab Abraham believed God, and we saw that in chapter 15. And therefore, because he believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. 17 years before circumcision, 100 years before the law was even given. Simply by believing the promises of God. And so there was a way to achieve righteousness in the Old Testament by believing the promises of God with regard to the son of promise who would come, not Isaac, 
but the greater son of promise. Not Moses, a greater than Moses. And obeying the Levitical system of sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins. All representing the ultimate sacrifice that would be in Christ. Amen? That's how they would receive forgiveness. Righteousness. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, says God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. So he's going to talk about the patriarchs, the fathers of the Hebrews. And the patriarchs became envious, sold Joseph. Now we're going to look at Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob, sold him into Egypt. But God was with Joseph and delivered him out of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Wow. Now, we said that there, there's several examples of probably 300 analogies that you can make with regard to the life of Joseph of Egypt, the prince of Egypt, right? That's what we call Joseph, the prince of Egypt, and, and Jesus Christ. What were some of those that we mentioned? The first time he came to his brothers, he was wearing his father's coat of many colors. And his brothers were envious. They were jealous. Why? Be because he was in his father's favor. Jesus came to his own, right? In his father's righteousness. In his own righteousness, really. Yet they were envious. They were jealous. And so the first time Joseph comes to his brothers, they reject him. And what happens to Joseph? He gets sold into slavery, right? And where does he get sold into slavery to? What does the text tell us? Let's see. And the patriarchs, verse 9, becoming jealous or envious of Joseph, sold him to Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor, grace, and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Wow. Now, why did the Pharaoh do that? <clears throat> He was rejected the first time by his own. He gets sold into slavery. Now he goes down into Egypt. Egyptians were not Jews. They were Gentiles. Okay? Joseph goes down into the Gentiles. And what happens when he's there among the Gentiles? They accept him. Why did they accept him? He delivered them. He saved them. He was their savior. He could interpret the Pharaoh's dream. And because of his interpretation of the dream and the wisdom that God gave him as to what Pharaoh should do, he preserved the people of Egypt, saved the Egyptians, the Gentiles. And what did Pharaoh offer him? Who was Patifera? Who was Patifera? No. That was the priest of An. Patifera had a daughter named Asineth. And that became Joseph's, through which he had two sons, Manasseh and, wow, he goes down, he removes himself from his brethren, he goes to the Gentiles, he preserves and saves the Gentiles, he receives for himself a Gentile, and through that bride he has children. Isn't that, oh my goodness, isn't that a something? Yeah, little Joey. Wow. <laughs> uh, now a famine and great trouble came over the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Thus Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all of his relatives to him, 75 people. And so Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died. And he and our fathers, and they carried him back to Shechem and laid him in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Isn't that amazing? But the, se the second time, Joseph comes to his brethren. They receive him. That's a, you know, that's a beautiful story. In general. Every time I read that story of the reunion of Joseph and his brothers, I cry. I cry. It's, it's such a touching, 
history of the Jews. Well, Stephen is recording for them that they rejected the one who was to be God's man for God's plan for their salvation, in part, Joseph. Hmm. But they're saying that he's the one who rejected God. He's the one who rejected the word. He was the one who's blaspheming the commandments of Moses and the temple. Just the opposite. Isn't it amazing how some today accuse us of the very thing they're doing? How it appears to me that one political party is always accusing another political party of exactly what they're doing. Isn't that amazing? And that's precisely what happened here. What's new? What do we learn from history? History continues to repeat itself. That's what we learn. Hmm? Well, go to verse 17 now in chapter 7. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied. This, this promise that he would deliver them from the bondage of Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph, and this man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time, Moses was born, the deliverer, God's man, right, for God's purposes, for God's way, for a salvation of his people, and was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and deed. Wow, we talked about that last week. We know some of the history of Moses. Moses was a great military leader and commander in Egypt. Moses wasn't anybody you want to mess with. He, he was a warrior. But not only was he a warrior, he was a very strikingly handsome man, history tells us. And not only was he a warrior, not only was he a handsome man, a man's man, but he was very intelligent. He had quite a brain. He seemed to have the whole package. What happens when some people have the whole package? Pride enters in. And you really think you're somebody. And so we looked at the text last time, and we said, you know, for 40 years, Moses was being brought up as the son of Pharaoh, right? And he really thought he was, yeah, he was somebody. He was God's gift. And, you know, I told you before, God has given the church power that if people are being oppressed or possessed of the devil, you know, we can do something about that. Yes, we have the power. But if a person is full of themselves, a man or a woman, what can we do about that? Nothing. Nothing. Only God's got to deal with that. Yeah. And, and so God was going to deal with this situation with Moses because he, he was so full of himself. There was no humility among Moses. That's what we see. But look at the text. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffering wrong, he defended him and avenged him who was oppressed. And he struck down the Egyptian. Hey, didn't they know he was going to be a deliverer, a protector? Hmm? He was going to defeat all their enemies? I guess not. So he struck down the Egyptian, verse 25, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not. Now, how could they not see I'm the answer to their problems? <laughs> Beloved, pride is an ugly, ugly, ugly thing in the eyes of God, you know. And so we, we have to do everything we can to destroy pride in our life. We need to come to the place of recognizing we are nothing. And Jesus says, is, is that true? I hope, I hope you realize that. I can do nothing apart from Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Yeah. And so, so Moses had to learn that lesson, a very painful lesson, but a needful lesson he must learn to deal with that pride issue of his. And the next day he appeared to two of them who were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, your brethren, why do you do wrong one another? Now, brothers shouldn't fight, should they? When, 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 when brothers fight, who is grieved more than anybody else? Mom and dad. Sure, mom and dad. There's, there's, there's nothing that grieves God's heart more than when we, as his children, begin to fight one another and devour one another. It should never happen. We, of all people, should be patient, long-suffering, kind, understanding, right? Forgiving one another. Recognizing the weakness in each of us. Hmm? 
Hmm. You're brothers. Why would you do such a thing? Right? But he who was his neighbor, who was he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away. Who did he push away? Who was Moses? The prince of Egypt. A slave. This nothing. This nobody. Pushing away. The prince of Egypt. Wow. Hey, is that what they did with Jesus? Peter would say to them, you crucified the prince of life. Mm. Pushing them away. Push Joseph away. Push Moses away. Push Jesus away. Oh, boy. There's a lot of religionists doing that today. They're all caught up in their religiosity and their rituals. But the real Jesus, they keep pushing away. Well, they pushed away Moses. Look what it says. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Isn't that what they said? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. Oh, isn't that interesting? So wait a minute, wait a minute. So Moses comes to his own the first time, and what did they do? Rejected him. And where did he go? Midian. Now, what happened when he went to Midian the first time? No. First time. First, first arrives. Just got there. This warrior, this commander. He sees these seven daughters of Jethro, the priest of Midian. And what's the problem? They're being harassed by these evil shepherds, these evil men. And what does he do? He swoops down and single-handedly rescues them. Wait a minute. He was rejected by his brethren. He turns to the Midianites, who were not Jews. They were Gentiles. And he rescues them. And in return, Jethro gives him Zipporah for his wife. For and he has two children. Wow. He turns to the Gentiles, rescues the Gentiles, and he receives a Gentile bride who gives him children. Coincidental, right? Coincidence is not a kosher word. God is sovereign. I know some of you may not agree with that, but I think he's in control. I do, I do. I've lost control a long time ago. <laughs> I turned it over to him, right? <laughs> yeah, I, let, me, let me give you, 43 years I've been walking with him, seeking him. 43 years. Let me tell you, can I give you a personal experience? I can? All right, I'll talk to you. They, they don't want me to. I'll mute you. <laughs> For the first part of that 43 years, I was really a, a, a man who embraced free will to, to a large extent. I mean, you know, this, this whole thing about predestination and election really bothered me because it didn't feel good, you know? Although it was pretty explicit in the text, it just didn't feel right to me, you know? And, and, and in my little pea brain, I started to judge God, thinking, well, if, 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 if the God of Calvinism, the God of election, the God of predestination, if all that's true, well, he's capricious and unjust. I mean, that's the conclusion you come to, Right? I mean, even Paul said that in Romans when he's explaining all of that and the sovereignty of God and election. And he says, is there unrighteousness with God? And what does he say? Yes. No, that's not what he says. He says, no, God forbid, perish the thought. May it never be. <laughs> all right, personal experience. When, when I'm trusting that I have the capacity to make all the right decisions... She knows. I fail. I, wait a minute. I'm a free will agent. You know? Hey, I'll decide when I want to drink this glass of water. It's up to me. You know? I mean, how much control do you really have? I mean, you know, everybody likes to be uh, <laughs> self determined, right? The self determination, guiding my own life, setting my own course, right? Cutting my own path. But, but listen to me now. Listen to me carefully. The more I believed that I had the ability to make the right choices, the more I failed. Now, why was that? 
Ishmael versus Yitzhak, the son of the flesh versus the son of promise. Now, now, and, and you know, it's probably been uh, the last, I'd say, ten years where I'm leaning more, much more heavily now on understanding the sovereignty of God in election predestination. And, and, and my experience has been the more I have just given over my decisions to him, wow, I seem to be making the right decisions most of the time. Isn't that wonderful? Now, I don't know about, I don't know about you. Maybe that's just my personal experience. So the, the more I believe I have the ability to make the right choices, I make the wrong choices because God's not going to honor my flesh. The more I completely surrender to his sovereignty and his will in my life, the more I seem to be making the right choices. Why? Because I'm honoring him first. You know, yeah. Even before I go to the medicine cabinet, I pray, Lord, you, you can do this, Lord. I look to you, Lord. Mm, good advice, right? Yeah, how do we get there? We're talking about Moses now. Moses goes to Midian and he receives, he rescues the people of Midian, the daughters of Jethro. Jethro, in return, gives him a bride. And through that bride, he has many children. Actually, two, right? And when the 40 years had passed, so 40 years in Egypt, learning that and believing that he was, 40 years he was in Egypt, learning and believing that he was, Somebody. And now he's 40 years in Midian chasing Jethro's sheep, doesn't own anything other than his, his wife and his two boys, right? And following sheep all day. Now he's learning that he's nobody. And so God had to take him from thinking he was a somebody to, to knowing and realizing he's a nobody and that God can take nobodies and do something. Right? Now, have you learned that yet? I got to tell you, my, my pride in my early years of walking with the Lord was such an ugly, ugly, ugly thing as I look back on it. You know, I'm so glad none of those tapes are available. <laughs> I know you, you probably didn't struggle with that problem, but I did. So for four, when the 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a, fl in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight of it. He drew near to observe, and the voice came to him from heaven, saying, I am God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What was that telling him? They're alive. He's the God of the living, not the God of the dead, right? And Moses trembled and dared not look. And then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard the groanings, and I have come down to deliver them. Now come, and I will send you to Egypt. Hmm. Communion. Right, we, today's Communion Sunday. It just came to me here for a moment. Here, let me see if I can find this. Uh, I, you know, I don't have notes when I teach, so I'm sorry. I'm not a manuscript preacher, so you're not going to get three points. And you know, I just don't do that. I just I don't know how. I'm just a fisherman. I know some other theologians that can do that, thoroughbreds, but I'm just not one of those. Okay, so something just came to me, and give me a moment. Well, it didn't come to me correctly. I've come down to deliver you, and now I come to send you to Egypt. Verse 35. This Moses, whom you rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought him out, and after that he's shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness 40 years. Amazing. So the second time Moses comes to his people, what happens? 
They receive him. Just, listen, just, just like Joseph, the first time Joseph came to his own, they rejected him. The second time, they receive him. The first time Moses comes to his own, they reject him. The second time now, under the power of the Holy Spirit, guided by God, God's man, God's way, God's will, right? They receive him. And that's what he's talking about here. The signs and the wonders that he did to be his, their deliverer out of Egypt. But what is the point that Stephen is making? You and your fathers have always rejected God. Never clearly have seen God's intent and God's purposes and God's will. And even now they were doing the same thing, although they were accusing him of doing what they actually do, blaspheming God, being hypocritical, being self-deceived, believing erroneously that they were in a relationship with God that didn't exist. People wouldn't do that today, would they? Would they? I would dare say that I believe that the majority of Christendom is living in self-deception, believing they're in a relationship with God that doesn't really exist. Oh, they check the block, the box. They may go to church a couple of Sundays a month. Uh, they, they may do a devotional now and then. They may even pray over their lunch. But are they really surrendered and devoted, yielded to God? Do they really know God intimately? Do they have that communion that we're talking about? Hmm, we'll talk more about that maybe next week. But here, this is precisely what was happening, and Stephen is making his case. How Moses had delivered them. Verse 37, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Now, who was that prophet that Moses was talking about in Deuteronomy? Jesus, of course. Moses had predicted the coming of Jesus. Now, if you ask an Orthodox Jew today, how will they recognize their Messiah when he comes? Because they don't believe he came the first time. But he did. Oh, but they'll recognize him the second time. Not all of them, but those who will be there at that time to have their eyes opened. But if you ask an Orthodox rabbi today, how will you recognize your Messiah? What will he say? He will be a man like Moses was a man, and he will allow us to rebuild our temple. That's what they'd say. But he's already come, and they didn't know it. Look what takes place. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the, what is it? Living oracles. What were they? What were the living oracles? I'm sorry? The commandments, the word of God, the law of Moses. Living oracles. For the word of God is alive and sharper than any. And what does it make a distinction of? That which is flesh and that which is spirit. That which is carnal, right? That which is eternal. We need to allow the living word. And then we call it the living word, right? Living oracles of God. Now, now listen to me. If all you do is read the Bible, but it doesn't penetrate from your mind to your heart, it's dead. It's a dead word. But it becomes the living word when you allow it to enter into your heart and to change your life. The question you have to ask yourself in your self-examination, is the word of God living in my life? Is it a living word? Now, let's get more specific and more intimate. Who is the word of God? Jesus. Jesus is called the word, the logos, the word of God. Is the living word living in your heart and life? I, I've discovered for me to really be the Christian that God desires me to be, that the word of God makes clear in his mandates to me. It's only possible as I allow the living word to live his life in and through me. Do you understand that? It's my surrender and my yieldness 
as a woman would surrender to her husband, right? And, and, and living her life through him. That's what, what should really happen in a marriage relationship. So too, as the bride of Christ, I surrender to Jesus Christ and allow his life to be lived through me. A woman is to live for the glory of her husband. Is that true? Does that sound pretty good? <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> the church is to live for the glory of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So now listen, listen. listen. They rejected the living word. Many of these Jews had huge portions of the Old Testament committed to memory. I don't care how much of the scripture you memorize. I don't care how much of the scripture you can spout out. How much of the scripture you're actually living. That's the key. That's the difference, you see. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. Now, that's what they were doing. They were dead to the word. Oh, they knew the word of God. They could recite the word of God, but it really didn't mean anything to them. Wrote religious practices and disciplines that didn't have any depth of meaning or relationship. That's the question. We, listen, time's running out. You think that? I, I think time is running out. I, I think we're so close to having a worldwide conflict right now. I don't think you realize how close we are to World War III. I don't think how you realize how close we are to a nuclear conflict. This babbling idiot in the White House. I'm sorry, I'm going to get political, OK? And if you don't like that, you know, well, I'm sorry. But I think you need to be informed. And yes, God establishes all those who are in power. If you go back and you read Isaiah. During the time when Israel was in such idolatry, in the worship of materialism, in the worship of sexual promiscuity, in the worship of child sacrifice, and then ultimately in the worship of the occult. God gave to Israel the leadership it deserved. You read the first few chapters of Isaiah, particularly Isaiah 4 and 5, and you'll discover that he had given them over to such ungodly leadership. If we look at what is taking place today, it parallels exactly what Stephen is accusing Israel of. The parallels are striking. That all God wanted to do far more, he had his highest and best in mind for Israel, but they rejected him. They rejected his man, his way, his will. We, as the United States of America, we are rejecting God. We are Romans 1. And in Romans chapter 1, what Paul reveals for us is what happens when God gives over a nation. And in chapter 1, in verse 24, he tells us that God gave them over to a sexual revolution. Did we have a sexual revolution in this country? When did we have that? In the 60s, in the 1960s, we had a sexual revolution. I grew up in that time. I was a young man at that time. And you know, uh, being a lost young man, I thought this was wonderful. It's not wonderful. There's nothing wonderful about it. It's very destructive. So in verse 24 of chapter, Romans chapter 1, he gives them over to a sexual revolution. But as the digression continues, in verse 26, God gave them over to what? A homosexual revolution, where men desired men, lusted after men, women after women, which is unnatural. Now, I, I don't care what anybody tries to tell me today. There is nothing natural about that sexual perversion. As much as the government would like to legislate those things that God calls an abomination, like same-sex marriage, like child sacrifice, what we call an abortion today, so God gave them over to a sexual revolution. Verse 26, God gave them over to a homosexual revolution. Verse 28, when, when the digression continues, it's precisely where we are today as a culture and a nation. He gave them over to what? A reprobate mind where they can't even think straight. Where 
Right is wrong and wrong is right. Up is down and down is up. Now, all of this is the influence of where we are in a spiritual condition of the nation. We, like Israel of old, like Stephen is declaring here, the indictments that he's bringing about against Israel, those same indictments can be brought about against the United States when God desired to do so much more for us. How much have, think about it, how much have each of us hindered God from doing his highest and his best in our life because we chose to go in our way rather than his way. Now, we can still be saved men and women, but we just don't choose to walk in his will completely. And what happens as a result of that? The negative effects of that are varying degrees, but eventually it'll never profit you. God had far more in mind for Israel. God had far more in mind for us as a nation. And look what we have done. We talk about child sacrifice and abusing our children. Well, we know how many we've aborted since abortion was legal in 1973. But now look at the spiritual and mental, emotional, physical, the mutilation and confusion we're bringing to our children today. This is sick. It's insanity. It's demonic. It will not profit us. Though the world be against him and you, but God be for us, we have nothing to worry about. None of this is new. None of this hasn't happened before. And what is the one thing we learn from history? We learn nothing from history. The greed, the lust, the pride of men is destroying us as a nation, as a people. My position is this. This culture is absolutely lost, short of an intervention of God. There is no seeming hope for the culture we're in right now because God himself has given us over. Do you understand that? And the only real salvation, the only real rescue is in the arms of Jesus. Next week, when we get together, we'll see the first martyr of the early church is Stephen. And why was he martyred? For telling the truth. Speaking the truth to power. Anyone who tries to speak truth to power today, their reputation, their character will be assassinated. They may even potentially be eliminated. You know. You know that that's true, right? Yeah. And anyone who would like to have a conversation afterwards to debate some of these things, I'd be happy to stay around. I love you, beloved. And Thank you, Malia. We need Amen. the truth from you. Yeah. I want to tell you the truth because I want to live to the truth. I won't, I won't believe their lie, and I won't share the lie with you because that will not benefit you or me. Jesus said, whom the Son of Man sets free shall be free indeed. Then he said, my truth shall set you free. My word is true. There is so much about this current culture and the government that we're under right now that is so much against the word of God. It's not true. And once a nation and a government begins to legislate that which God says is an abomination, that's the beginning of the end. World War II. We fought the axis of evil and we won. Why did we win? God was on our side. More appropriately, we were on the side of God. And God wanted to bring his people home, the Jews to their homeland, Israel. That was the result. And, and who took credit for that victory? We did. They were the greatest. My father, my uncles, so many men that I worked with 
you know, when I was in a factory environment who were World War II veterans. But, but they took credit for what had happened. We did it. We made it happen. Who made it happen? Do you know we haven't won a conflict since? Did we win the Korean War? The Vietnam War? Afghanistan? We haven't won a war since. Why? Because we haven't given him his due. When I believe I have the power to make all the right decisions and I don't need to consult him, oh boy. But when I yield and surrender and submit myself to him and his wisdom and the living word, life becomes so simple and so sweet. People will say, well, it's complicated out there. Yeah, it's complicated because sin complicates everything. Lies, deceit, complicates everything. The truth shines bright. My word is truth. My truth will set you free. Amen? Amen. Shall we stand? Pastor David?